Hello, Mitzvah TV. I'm here with Micha, and Micha is a Chayalim. Uh, Micha, can you tell me a little bit about what it's like to be a soldier, or where are you stationed, or what what type of soldier are you? Yeah, uh, I'm in Golani, uh, Sergeant in Golani, Kamish and Bachad. We were stationed in Lebanon, and then when the whole war started, we went down to Gaza, and we waited outside Gaza for two weeks, and then we went into Gaza to a uh, community called Sajaya and uh, cleaned it out. And uh, it was very difficult, but uh, we, we accomplished all of our goals and uh, did what we needed to do. Now, when you say you were in Gaza and you cleaned it out, so were you one of the soldiers that, um, when the whole world was watching and everybody was davening and praying, were you one of the type of people that went in, you saw the schools that were up on top of terror tunnels, you saw all that type of stuff? Yeah, we, uh, we were the first group to go into the town yeah. and uh, we, uh, we saw everything. We, we went in and uh, they had set up ambushes and we had to uh, fight through their ambushes and then searched through all the houses for weapons and tunnels and we found a tunnel to, that was going into Israel and we found lots of weapons. And uh, we also, uh, we, we took over a lot of houses and we saw a lot of Hamas things. Uh, we, uh, train. we found a lot of ammunition. Uh, no, bags. wait a second, because... Okay. Um, now, you, you mentioned houses. A lot of people, when they saw the news, um, they were really upset because they said there was, um, why are you going into people's homes? But from what I understand, it's it's not like if you would come to my house here, I live, and I have a cat, and I have some meat in the freezer, and things like that. You saw things in a person's house that if it was really a, a regular person, they they wouldn't have it. Oh, no, we, uh, before we went in, the Air Force dropped pamphlets, like many days before. So they knew we were coming in, and they knew they had to leave. And they had ample warning. And actually, before we started the mission, we got to the border, and they told us we couldn't go in yet because Hamas had made the people come back as human shields to stay in the houses. Um, Wait, so I have a question. You, you, we heard... Sorry. Sorry. We heard a lot about um, this dropping of pamphlets. Were the pamphlets written only in Hebrew? Or how no, was no, the people they're, supposed they're, to understand what the pamphlets said? They're in Arabic. And uh, there's safe zones within Gaza that people are... There's a UN safe zone that people are able to get to. And they were given ample warning beforehand. But they were forced to come back by Hamas to be used as human shields to prevent us from going in. So uh, you you personally saw Hamas pushing civilians back into homes? No, I mean uh, later we did. We saw them push, push pushing people, but uh, at the beginning we we didn't. We just we were told all the civilians left, and then Hamas made them go back in. And and what were the ages and the demographics of the civilians that you saw? Uh, mostly boys between the age of five to twenty-five. I'm worried about this light behind you. Can you move maybe? Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you wait. So wait a second. So you saw ba boys ages what age? Five to twenty-five. Uh, no, we five what? Five boys? Five years old. So I just want to make sure that that we really understand. You saw Hamas pushing five-year-old boys back into areas that were designated as dangerous. Well, they they were trying to push them, and we would prevent them. But uh, yeah. Why would you prevent them if you're a soldier? Uh, we were told during the ceasefire, this was during the ceasefire days. Mm -hmm. that during the days where ceasefires, we had a line of uh, houses that we were holding, and we weren't allowed to let them pass those lines because we were still searching within that area for tunnels, and we couldn't let them back into that area. And uh, the houses we went into, they had been given ample, ample warning that we were we were coming. And before we go, we, we, give, them, we give them more warnings and warning shots. Um, the civilians there get many chances. Uh, before we even went into Gaza, eight months ago when I was on patrol on the border of Gaza, we saw a dad one day, he uh, came to the fence with a five-year-old, six-year-old boy on his hands and he planted a bomb on the fence and we kept asking for permission to shoot the, uh, the guy, but we couldn't because he was with his kid the whole time. And so, uh, and then we didn't get permission. To, to get permission to shoot in the Israeli army, you have to ask for permission from a lot of people. It's not a simple thing. Uh, we take a lot of precautions, so it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to actually get permission to shoot. So, okay, so a lot of people, um, like, I don't think they... You, you explained to me um, how you think the war is difficult to win based on certain things that you saw in the school and the, the mentality um, of, of who you are as a fighter, as a soldier. When people think of a soldier, they think of, like, I see you, you have a gun. They think of a person with a gun that's, you know, there to shoot people. 
And you're saying to me that the civilians are, in a way, soldiers. They may not um, have 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 uh, suits like you do, but if they're if they're willing to die for something and they're doing proactive measures, you're also willing to die. When you go and you you swear to be an IDF soldier, it means you're willing to die. You have a gun and you're willing to do whatever it takes to defend Jewish people. But you're saying to me you're not willing to um, just kill without even authorization. So you are not even allowed to kill someone without permission. Without permission. Yeah. And how and that's different than they who are trying to die yeah. stum. Uh, can you talk things, about what you saw in the school? Yeah, one of the things we noticed about what you just said actually is interesting that uh, in our vests we carry lots of first aid gear and we found a lot of Hamas vests, combat vests and instead of first aid gear they just put in extra grenades. We thought that was interesting. They don't carry first aid equipment on them. Uh, I guess it's just not a priority. And uh, yeah, we, we, we killed a lot of terrorists but the idea is something that I don't think we can kill. Um, when we went into a lot of, we went into a school and we saw next to the blackboard there was a diagram of how to take apart weapons and put them back together again. And when we went into lots of houses in the nurseries where they keep their children, there was cribs and pictures of Mickey Mouse. I remember there was stickers of Mickey Mouse on the on the wall, and next to the Mickey Mouse were stickers of suicide bombers. How do you how do you know that they were suicide bombers? Maybe they were just family members. Oh no no, it's a whole trading card that they have there. It's a. Uh, like, you see them everywhere. It's all over there. Uh, stickers of uh, ex-suicide bombers who were killed, uh, holding, like, posing with guns and uh, in suicide bomb vests. And you see them in all the houses. And uh, and, and you promised me that you that's what you literally saw in houses. Yeah. And no, it's everywhere. You saw it all over the place. And uh, more than that, we always found their photo albums of the families. And in all the photo albums, every single one, there was always pictures of the dad posing with a weapon and then the young boys, like, between the age of, like, four and seven, posing with weapons in front of backdrops of the Kota. Uh, you see that everywhere. And what do you think the purpose of that is? So, uh, seems like that's uh, something that people who are part of Hamas in Gaza educate their children young. To okay. hate us at a young age. It's impossible to say that every person in, in Gaza hates us and wants to kill us, but we did see that the Hamas culture is infected everywhere in the culture. And uh, it's, it's very hard to tell who is and who isn't. Um, very hard to tell. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the presence that Fayaleem received, or the support, or how it felt, or um, when you were on the front lines, how you were feeling, versus um, how it felt when you felt supported. It was, it was amazing. Um, we got so much support. Before we went in, every day we would get pizza and hamburgers and uh, all different types of food. And gear, we got generators and phone, iPhones and iPods and vests. And we, we got everything. We got so much love. The day we got out of Gaza, we went to take our first shower, and all these mothers were there waiting with towels and fresh clothes to change. And uh, everywhere we went, we got love from people. It was, it was absolutely incredible. And you, you said something about one of your favorite care packages. That You, you said there were two things in that care package. It's really funny oh, because... The, uh, yeah, so. Oh, we got uh, Tabasco sauce, which is uh, really important. It's really nice because... Wait, hold on a second. Just so that you know. Yeah. So... Um, I went and bought a whole bunch of Tabasco sauce, right. so it's very possible that you got the Tabasco Could sauce be. that I sent. So it's really so amazing. Yeah. When uh, when you give to duck, when you give charity to somebody, one of the highest levels is um, to give it to somebody that you don't know. And and they, you know, it's it's nice when somebody says, "Can I have something?" and then you give it to them, but you sort of get something back from that because somebody says to you, "Thank you," and like it's you know, you're doing it from the bottom of your heart, but you feel good about yourself. Yeah. But when you give charity and you don't know the person or where it's going, it's like a super high level. And to be able to meet you at the hotel and to hear the story even of the Tabasco sauce, it's amazing because not many people get a chance to see the reciprocation of of what they give. Hold on a second. Um, so, so this Shabbat, and by the way, you know, the, the way that I just want to let you guys know, the way that I met him is that I went to the Kotel to go and uh, pray and daven that I would get, you know, the, the right soldiers coming to this meal that we're having, um, August 15th and 16th, it's a whole Shabbaton dedicated to Chayalim and Olim. And I'm organizing it, and I was a little stressed out. There's so much to do, and I went to go pray and sort of like do a checklist of all the things that I had to do. And I saw soldiers, but so many of them had kipot on their head, and not all the time do I see that. And I, I asked them, what brigade are they on? Are they like the religious group? And you said they were Golani, which was... I didn't know that Golani was so religious. I know you have to go. He's so tired. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about um, how the war affected your troops? And... and 
if you would or would able to come to our Shabbat and why yes or why no? Uh, I can't come to the Shabbat. I have to guard. Uh, my kita has, has to guard our tanks. But uh, yeah, usually my soldiers, I mean, they're really just some, some aren't. Uh, they usually don't wear kippahs. But before the war started, everyone just started getting much more religious. Everyone started putting on uh, sitzis and putting on tefillin every day, even the most chilani people. Everyone started carrying tefillin, tefillin everywhere and saying tefillin all the time and carrying zohars and skulas and it was, it was amazing. And uh, before we went in, I told all my soldiers they have to wear sitzis when we went in, like for extra protection and everyone put on sitzis and uh, we, uh, everyone was putting on tefillin. And I remember as we were driving into Gaza, everyone was reading tons and tons of Tehillim and smoking a lot of cigarettes. Everyone was very scared, but uh, everyone's been much more religious. We bought them cigarettes too, by the way. Um, the so we're, we're wrapping it up now, but I just right. wanted to, to thank you. And um, uh, this this Shabbat was inspired by, um, for me, there was a negative article that said um, that, that Max Steinberg is dead and it's because of birthright, because on a birthright trip, he went to Har Herzl. He saw the grave of Michael Levine, who was the first American who had made Alia killed in duty. And um, because he was inspired to join IDF based on that, now he's dead. Um, and this Shabbat uh, is geared towards welcoming the 300 Olim that thank you very much just made Aliyah today. It's Tu B'Av. We love you. We wanted to give you a Shabbat and bring to you living soldiers. Um, because if the problem is that seeing the grave you know, you, you were saying that in, in, in Gaza you saw that they had idealized suicide bombers, people who had, um, t had, had spent their life and now were dead fighting for what they believed in. And therefore we wanted to invite living people who we still believe in uh, to come and meet you and so that we could thank you. We, we are a very different... Hold on a second. We are a very different culture. We're not trying to brainwash people to, to glorify those who are killed in service. When people here are killed in service, we mourn for them, we wish they were alive. And uh, above all that we want to honor our living Kyleen. Can, can you take this off so we can see the keeper on your head? Yeah. It's so beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a Golani sergeant, Sergeant Micha. Um, we want to say thank you to him and his brigade. If you have any uh, words of, of well wishes for us or the story you were saying to, about Max and, and uh, yeah. signing off. No, I, uh, I, I didn't know Max. I met him right before we went in. Right. And, uh, yeah. One of my soldiers was one of his roommates, and uh, I met him right before we went in. I only spoke to him for a bit. Uh, we were giving each other a little bit of a pep talk, you know, give each other co -op. and I just was shocked at how like unscared he was. He was so so excited and so unbelievably motivated, and he knew exactly. He just seemed so confident. And I remember being shocked because I was pretending that I wasn't scared before for all my soldiers, and I was actually scared. And I just like he seemed really, really, really ready to go, and I was really impressed by that. I don't know, I think that anyone who says he, he died because he was taken to the grave of Michael Levine, that's just ridiculous. You can't say something like that. It's just, it's like, a, a, I can give some crazy examples. That's just, it's silly. It's silly. He was doing what he wanted to do. He seemed like a guy who was doing exactly what he knew he needed to do. So, um, Micha, I'm really sorry that you are um, unable to come for Shabbat, but I'm totally happy that that it's boys like you that are guarding us. This this Shabbat is dedicated to guarding the Shabbat. It's Olim and Chayalim. We want to introduce our newest heroes, those who have made Aliyah, to the heroes that have been helping us for the last month. And if anybody's interested in making donations uh, to sponsor the lunch, you can do that through the Am Yisrael Foundation, uh, care of White City Shabbat. And we want to thank you. When, when people hear um, the things that the stories that you you've told me um, about, I think it's enough for for anyone to put a keeper on their head. You you, um, I wish we had more time to talk to you, but he's so tired. Clever, he wants to go home. He wants to sleep. I probably he probably wants to take a shower. It's too bad. Wait, can we say hi to your girlfriend? And say thank you. Look, <laughs> she's so nice. She's been waiting for him for so long, and he's he took. 14 minutes, about 15 by the time we stop this, to, to thank you. He loves his girlfriend. It's Tuba Av. He took her out, but he stopped because he wanted to say thank you uh, to the people that have been, been supporting and loving and to keep going and to keep continuing. And hopefully all the situation will be finished, um, but your work is never done as a Jew to help another Jew. And we thank you and we love you. You're invited to Shabbat, everyone. Thank you very much. Tadagavah. Good job.